Welcome to Handcrafting Your Retirement with Brett Ramsey from Artisan Wealth Strategies. In this podcast, we help retirees as well as those who are considering retirement overcome generic wealth management advice that limits your future. We do this by handcrafting customized financial strategies centered on your unique lifestyle. Jump on board for this journey where we delve into strategies that can help make your money outlast you as Brett draws from years of experience with guest experts to eliminate cookie cutter saving strategies. Hello and welcome to Handcrafting Your Retirement with your host, Brett Ramsey. It's the first of many episodes to come where we will talk about what you want in retirement and how to make it happen. I'm Wendy McConnell. Hello, Brett. How are you feeling on this very first episode? Excited to be here, Wendy. Really just uh, energized to help people learn more about how to get the right answers for them, not just the generic answers that they find all over the internet. So we're excited about that. Yeah, exactly. Now you were doing a little uh, pre-gaming. Let's, let's talk about what you studied to, um, to get prepared for this first episode. Come on, tell us. Well, I'm a, I'm a simple minded fellow, but I, I, I find it, uh, I like to steal from others. That's a phrase that I was taught early in my career is find people that are doing something well and then try to copy them. So one of my favorite things is old Saturday Night Live episodes, and there happened to be one where there was an NPR broadcast. And as soon as you put this microphone and these headphones on me, I felt like I was in the delicious dish. And if you don't know that skit, you need to go look it up. It'll make you laugh. Uh, we're not in the holiday season yet, but it, it'll make you smile. Yes, I have to go look it up myself. I don't remember that one. Uh, I didn't watch a lot of Saturday Night Live, but I know that you can find any clip from any time at any moment. It, that's amazing thing about the internet. There's been some great advancements, I would say, and the ability to find things quickly. And uh, just like I said, SNL, delicious dish. You will smile. You'll thank me for that one. Just like the way you say delicious dish. <laughs> if you heard their voices, it would make you even more excited to see what's next on the delicious dish. I can hardly, hardly contain myself, Brett. Okay. So let's get down to business. Um, how did you get into this industry. Tell us a little bit about your history. Well, I appreciate that question because I think most people jump right into their professional lives and that's where they like to start the story. But for me, this story really began at a very young age. Um, I was the only child. Um, my dad, my mom and I, we moved a lot. And so I spent a lot of time with my dad. My dad happened to have a background in, in accounting and finance. And so when he would get home from work, my mom would cook dinner, a very traditional family situation. And I would go in every night when my dad would get, get there, we would go in and we'd start watching the nightly business report with a man named Paul Kangas. And that was on, um, you know, PBS. And that's what we did every night. And he started teaching me about investing in stock markets. And uh, there was just this time where I remember uh, his company, um, he happened to have spent his entire career working for Firestone. And uh, they were in the process of actually being acquired by an international company. And so he was showing me how the stock prices were were changing so very rapidly because multiple companies were bidding on his. And so uh, he decided to sell his stock because he had a really, really nice gain. And then after that, a new company came in and bid on it. And it really literally like doubled the price of the stock. So every day, I would watch the nightly business report, find the ticker symbol across the bottom, find Firestone stock and calculate how much money my dad didn't make. Oh, no. And and from that, though, what he taught me was a very valuable lesson was he actually started showing me his personal net worth statement that he started the year I was born. So every year he would calculate exactly what his net worth was. And he started showing me how his value had grown and how it had compounded and how he made a very, very nice profit on that. And so really early on, I kind of learned about goals and objectives and how to do that. And I didn't really think a lot about that until my first day of of real work. After I graduated from college, I was fortunate enough to be hired by a large company. And they brought all the new employees into this big conference room and they had their HR people in there and they're teaching about our benefits and telling us how to do it. Well, they'd sent us these handbooks. So I'd read through all the handbooks. So talk to my dad. Of course, he's been a great advisor to me my whole life. And uh, I already kind of knew everything. I already knew what I was going to roll in. I knew what the benefits were and a lot of very smart, well-educated, you know, bachelors of science and masters of science people were in the room with me. And most of them had no idea what the heck, like the 401k was and how to enroll in their healthcare benefits. And I found myself throughout the entire day, 
making friends um, with these folks and then helping them understand like what it meant. And uh, one of the things I remember real quickly was one of my good friends. Uh, he was like, oh, I can't do that 401k. I pay off my student loans. I'm like, dude, free money. I'm like, you got to do it. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, they're telling you right here, if you put in seven, they match you 50 cents on the dollar. It's a three and a half percent free money deal. I said, you got to do that. And so just very on, I realized that there was just things that I knew that other people didn't know simply because of the background that I had and the great relationship I had with my father and how much time he spent teaching me these things. And so um, when I started getting more and more opportunities to lead, I started realizing that uh, so many of my employees that were working for me in the organization just really hadn't had someone hold their hand and walk them through it. And so I didn't realize it, but really I was starting my business even then because I really just cared so deeply about helping these people. I made it a really conscious effort uh, to not let that happen to the people that I cared about. And so that's really the origin of my business. And then uh, through some other career steps, I had some opportunity to get into uh, the financial services industry itself and started learning, hey, I don't really want to be in corporate America. I would rather be in that last part of the relationship, working one-on-one, helping individuals and families, figuring out how and when to retire and trying to help them make sure that their money's lasting at least one day longer than they do. That's a great philosophy. I like that. Have your money last one day longer than you do. Um, the question that I have, though, were you able to talk your friend into putting in for the 401k? I did help him get into the 401k. And now he's a big level executive uh, in Texas for a big uh, um, computer manufacturing, equipment manufacturing company. Um, I helped him get out of debt, pay off his car, um, get out from underneath his student loans. Um, you was, have a percentage? Uh, Did you get a percentage of that? No, I didn't at the time. I wasn't <laughs> smart enough to understand that that's what that's what I was doing. You're like, what? Wait, people pay me for this? I, well, I didn't know, and uh, and probably my greatest, uh, uh, quite frankly, the most satisfying experience. He was he was great. He ended up being a groomsman in my wedding, so obviously, I, I think very highly of him. But there was a few years later when uh, I had my first real leadership position, and I had about 150 employees that worked for me at a factory in Kentucky, and. Um, when my first shift team leaders was getting a 30 year service award, I remember this so vividly. I was like, he's a bright guy, did great work for me, really excited about it. And these th- service awards were a big deal. So you got to pick out these uh, things out of a catalog. So I helped him find his award and we were having this little ceremony. And, and I asked him this question that day, cause this was General Electric in the nineties. Stock was blowing up. Everybody it was not unusual for us to have millionaires that worked in our factories. And I thought, this is a smart guy. Like he's, he's, he's ready. He's, he's equipped himself. And I said, so when are you going to think about retiring? And he got quiet. And uh, if you knew this guy, you knew he was never quiet. So I knew I'd hit a nerve and I I diverted off of that. And the next day he kind of, he kind of came around and he said, Hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm not enrolled in, in that plan. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're not enrolled in the plan. I'm like, you've been here for 30 years. The plan started in 1986. I'm like, what, what's going on? So, um, I went in there and I helped him enroll and a year later he walked in with his 401k statement and laid it down in front of my, uh, on my desk. And he said, I've never saved that much money before in my life. Thank you. In one year. In one year. And just simply because I helped him get enrolled and get the free money. And I, I just remember how I felt when I saw how happy he was as he was moving towards his goals. And I was like, I didn't realize it then, but that moment probably was the moment that really, made it very clear to me that like your experiences and the value and the knowledge of helping people and being there for them, that really was the moment that it started for me where I didn't know it then, but I can look about uh, back on that now and realize that that's it. That's the thing that gets me up in the morning. That makes me the most excited about what I get to do is when you can really just see the change in someone's life that what I perceive to be fairly small, simple adjustments, the impact that it has when it gets magnified over time. And so it's just been a great um, understanding for me of trying to find my passion. And that's really a big part of what I try to help people do is figure out what's important to them and then how to align their resources and make sure that that's what they do with them, right? Is this is just uh, back to, I'm an old uh, recovering athlete. Um, I call it alignment and assignment. If you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, you don't know what your assignment is, how are you going to do it? So um, that's really a big part of my practice is helping people just figure that out. What do you want to accomplish? Now let's get lined up right. So how much information do you need 
to get started on this. Like, I'm, I'm very shocked to hear about a man that had been working for a company for 30 years and then made a ton of money in his first year in a 401k. Um, we obviously don't recommend that you wait that long. Um, no. <laughs> That's not the game plan, right? <laughs> but you were able to help him before it was too late. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what I try to tell people is the first thing that you got to know about financial planning, and you'd ask the question kind of what information is needed, is that where you are is where you are, right? And so sometimes that difficulty of just gathering your own information and putting it down on paper is a daunting task for some people. I've done a lot of uh, work personally in my health and trying to improve my health as I age and aging well, I call it. Um, and one of the most things, surprising things that I learned about that is that people don't want to buy a scale. We don't want to know. Because they don't want to know. Because if I step on it and now I know, now I have this knowledge and then I got to do something about it. And so if I'm ignorant, if I don't know, if I, then it's less scary to me somehow. And I didn't really think about that. And it's not quite how I'm personally wired. Um, but I think it's because of my sports background and because of my goals and objectives kind of way of, of living my life that I'm, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. How daunting a task that is for some people, right? Is that some folks just need help, like getting their data together, figuring out where am I? Because we can all have these grandiose visions and pictures and plans of what we think it looks like in the future. But if we don't know where we are, I don't know how the world to build a roadmap to get to where you want to go if, if you don't know where you are. And so that very first step, that very first self-awareness of allowing yourself to kind of come to grips with where you are, who you are, right, doesn't mean that's who you're going to be or where you're going to stay. But what that does allow you to do is start to understand, hey, this is where I'm at, okay? And for some people, it's a shocker, both positive and negative. Right. Some people have it in their head that they have to accomplish a certain age or have to get to a certain level of wealth before they can get to where they want. Other people are, are uh, under resourced and they're uh, kind of behind the curve. And so we have to start kind of modifying those dreams a little bit and figuring out what we can and cannot do and why uh, and then getting excited about it. So I'm a big fan of, you know, once we kind of pick a goal, man, let's get excited about it. Let's go do it. Right. So uh, uh, that, that hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about what it takes to get started. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit of your life outside the office. Now, when you are working, what is it that you like to do for fun besides watch Saturday Night Live clips? <laughs> well, I don't watch a lot of Saturday Night Live anymore. Uh, I'm not up that late um, uh, <laughs> because the things that I like to do mostly are, are to be honest, our family uh, and friends. Uh, I'm, I'm married. I have three children. Um, and my, my family has been a big part of my whole life. Obviously I told you the story about my dad. I didn't speak about my mom, but my mom unfortunately passed away when she was 48 and, uh, I had a great relationship with her and that had a huge impact on me and also my father and starting to look at, at what life looks like down the road. And so made me really take a, a very different approach to how I viewed being a husband and a parent. And so really, uh, decided to start my own business for lots of reasons, but mostly it was because I wanted to not be at the whim of a large corporation that forced me to travel all over the place. So I've been really blessed, uh, been able to be very, very active in my children's lives and in the community, volunteered a lot um, for local sports organizations, have been able to really give back a lot there and coach a lot of teams and be around a lot of young kids and, and pour into their lives, which has been awesome and amazing for me. Um, uh, just loved being the dad that sometimes got to be there uh, and reading the stories to the kids when they were in kindergarten and uh, being Mr. Grant's dad and all that cool stuff that happened from that and being a part of that, but then also just being able to give back to the community in other ways. So pretty active there. Uh, like to be physically active, like to be outside, love to be able to walk, um, uh, you know, playing around a golf is great, but it's not so much about the golf. It's more about the walk and the relationships and being out there uh, doing that kind of stuff. So that's, that's what I try to spend my time doing when I'm not here. So you've been a coach to some of your kids' sports teams. And some other teams uh, actually got my most exciting. I think I love coaching my, I love coaching kids. 
Uh, I love coaching adults too, but I, I love coaching people that want to be coached. And I find that kids are really excited about being coached. Actually, the teams that I've probably gotten the most enjoyment out of coaching were ones that my children weren't on. Uh, I found that I was actually a better coach to others than I was to my own kids because my expectations were very different. Um, it actually helped, I think, make me a better father at times when I started to realize that I was not necessarily their best coach. Um, probably the really the, the the part of that that crystallized it for me was my youngest. Uh, he was very small and, and I'd just been coaching some boys, like literally little boys first, second grade boys in basketball. And there was a tryout for a team and we had 10 boys on the team and nine of the 10 boys made the travel roster. The boy that didn't was my son. And that was a little devastating to me at times uh, because it was like, man, what did I, what did I do wrong? I helped all these other kids, but somehow I wasn't able to help my own kid. Um, but that was the wrong mindset. So I, I got him on another team and uh, he was coached by a, an ex NBA player, someone who way better basketball player and coach than I was. And uh, he flourished. And in his first game, I'm over there and I'm cheering and we go out for dinner. And my little third grade son, you know, sits down there in the booth next to me and slides up. And he, he asked me, he goes, Dad, tonight at that game, uh, you were you were yelling. And I thought really hard about it. And I was like, I don't think I was yelling. He goes, um, it was different. He goes, what was that? And I go, I think I was cheering. <laughs> and uh, he goes, oh, that was cheering. I was like, yeah, I was excited. Your team was fun. It's exciting. You know, I was cheering. I was, uh, was it encouraging? He goes, yeah, yeah. I, I, he goes, but when I was on that other team and you were yelling, it was different than tonight. Uh -oh. And uh thought really hard and I was like, oh, well, I was the coach of that team. So I was coaching and uh he goes, dad, he goes, I like cheering way better than coaching. He goes, maybe when I'm a little older, you can start coaching me again. But right now, can you just cheer? And uh, cut me to the core, right? As a dad, right, you're sitting there, you right? realize like, holy cow, like my literally, you know, seven-year-old son, eight-year-old son's way wiser than I am. And what he needed was cheering. And so sometimes in this role, one of the things you got to understand is when you need to be coaching and when you need to be cheering. And uh, and it's not always coaching, right? It's sometimes it's cheering. And so sometimes people just need a cheerleader. And so that's actually one of my favorite little goofy songs. You're going to find out I like music, but there's a a little song uh, about, Hey, uh, I need a cheerleader. And uh, that's true. I think in life, we need people that are rooting for us. And so sometimes my role is not so much uh, super technical, but more emotional, right. Of helping people and getting excited about their goals, their objectives and cheering for them and helping them know that they can accomplish the things that they want and that they can win the game that they're playing. So uh, that's a, that's, been really a, a life-changing experience for me is starting to really understand um, how valuable the, the a great coach is, someone that believes in you, someone that can guide you, and has wisdom and ability to correct your, your errors and put you on the right path. But then sometimes you just need a coach to say, you can do it. Go make that play. You got it. Well, kudos to you for, um, for taking the words of your son and turning it into something that just benefited you in life and business. Yeah. In our relationship, uh, there's no way that it would be as strong today. If I had continued to pound on him as a coach, he, the corrective nature of that was not what he needed from me. He needed me to be his biggest fan. And really then I'd applied I, I, to my other kids. I have three distinct kids. And what I try to tell everybody is the first one, she needed me to yell at her. Like she performed better when I got onto her and she knows that, and she wanted that middle child. If I got onto her, she cried. That was not a good system. No. Um, and uh, she realized though, that I was a good coach, that I had her best interest at heart, but that it was really hard for her to take the criticism that coaching provides, right? The, the feedback, the corrective nature. And for me, she couldn't really take that when she was younger because she quite frankly looks up to me. Um, we, um, are very similar. And so it was hard for her to hear that from me. Um, and so I had to learn how to dial that back down in order to strengthen our relationship and allow her to grow into the amazing young woman that she's become is that she needed, you know, she didn't need that from me and that maybe that wasn't her path to be a great 
athlete that her path might be something different. She's studying rocket science now in, uh, at Georgia Tech, which is a riot because that was my undergraduate degree. Oh, the child, no big deal. Rocket science. <laughs> yeah. The, the child that thinks she's the least like me has become exactly like me in some ways. So that hurts her heart. Uh, it makes mine excited and happy for her. It'd be so much easier if they were all exactly the same. And, you know, by the time the third one came around, you had it down. <laughs> oh, I would have. Wouldn't that be great? Right. And then it was fascinating because as an only child, I had no idea. I thought when the second one came out, she would be exactly like the first one. Whoa, are yeah. they not the same? Well, and it's amazing to me that, you know, you bring that up. Me and my sister couldn't be more different human beings. And I'm like, OK, we have the same upbringing, the same parents. Like, it's kind of crazy. But, yeah, everybody's their own. Each little person. Yes. And, and really that's the, the way we look at and why we, we use the phrase handcrafted in artists and wealth strategies, right? Is because we believe that each person and family is truly unique. And that if we don't get to know them, if we don't get to understand what makes them special, what makes them unique, what do they need, then how do we provide it? Right. And so um, we just really try to take uh, that type of an approach that it is relational, that it's time-based, that we're going to get to know you. Um, it's not a sprint. It's not transactional. You know, you're not some other, you know, product of our assembly line, you know, that you are someone that has unique situation and we want to know it. We want to know you. And then we want to make sure we're giving you the absolute best guidance and advice that we can provide uh, to help you accomplish what's important to you and no one else can know what's important to you until, and, uh, and so that's actually, I think one of our biggest challenges is most of the time, many of our clients have never really had to reveal themselves to anyone else and talk to anyone about what's important to them. And so they just assume Sometimes that they don't know themselves. They don't. And so it's like fascinating because everybody just wants to get it down to, Oh, What's my number, all the commercials that they see on TV. And, and yes, we do have to start to put the math behind the story to make sure that it's going to work. But if we start with the math, um, I just, I have found it. That's the reason why it's taken me this long, I think, to, to grow into who I'm supposed to be, right? Is that I had to really change my belief system around what was important because being a numbers oriented person, I, I, I basically put everything into a number. And then I realized the numbers don't matter if I don't know the people. And so that's been the biggest evolution for me as well. Well, if you did have all the money in the world, what is it that you would like to do? Well, as uh, everybody in my family would know is I want to build, build field houses. <laughs> and so this is a crazy sounding story, but what I, what I like to see is uh, I just believe that access and opportunity for people to, uh, to be able to be active, to, to be out there chasing their dreams is very important. And I've lived mostly in the Midwest my entire life. And to be honest, the weather kind of starts to get a little bit gloomy and uh, um if you, you don't have a, a winter sport, we also don't get enough snow. So we're just kind of stuck in this spot where the weather is not that good, um, but but it's not really that cold. So if you go further north, there are people that have really gotten into, uh, you know, winter sports. Um, and we're just not here in the parts of the Midwest that I've lived. So I just believe that every little town needs a field house. It needs some place where the kids can go in there and they can, uh, you know, run around and play games and have a blast. And, uh, um you know, I've joked about that for years and, and, uh, what's crazy right now in our town, there's literally been a field house that's been built. Uh, they're actually getting ready to build like two more. Uh, and so, um, I just see what that allows the kids and, and the families to do. And, I, and I'm just a huge believer in that. So, um, you know, that, that's just something that's very important to me. I, I want, I want kids that get a chance to be kids. I want them to play games and I want to get them out there running around and every kid can't run around in that regard. So I want to have access, right? I want to have the ability for kids to be kids. I think that adults need a field house too. We still need to play. Actually, that's one of the things that my uh, good, good friend has talked about is uh, building a lifestyle center, right? And so if you were uh, talking to my wife right now, she believes that every corner should have a pickleball court on it. Um, I'm a and, pickleball fan. And uh, uh, that that is, you know, like basically what I, I joke about is that's one of the things that we talk about as people near retirement, right? Is that what do you do, right? So if you've been working and you're putting whatever your number is, 40, 50 hours a week into that, and now we remove that, 
what do you fill that time with? And there's a relational component. So we've actually done a lot of uh, educational training classes around this concept with our, our clients through the years of helping them understand better what is important to me with my time. How are my relationships uh, um, impacted by this this new time component? And basically, what are the activities and things that you're going to want to do and, and practice them? Because if you think you're going to walk out the door that first day of retirement and you're going to become a pro pickleball player and the reality is that you can't play pickleball or you hate it, then all of a sudden your retirement's not going to really turn out the way you want. And we see, especially in men, not as frequently in women, but in men, they get depressed when they retire because so many of their relationships and their identity was really tied to their profession or their work life that they have a hard time identifying uh, with these other things. So we talk about practicing. So one of the big things I think about being an athlete too, is we don't play, spend all of our time playing games, right? Most of the time we practice, we practice about three times more than we play. And that's really hard. I think for people that want to be great at the game, that they have to become great at the practice habits, right? And those habits and things are, are, how do we do that? So we really want to get into this idea of, you know, a couple of years before you're deciding to leave work, how do we start to downshift our time and start practicing the other activities that we think we're going to want to do with our time uh, and find out if they really is what we want to do. Um, because that is the biggest disappointment for some is that the activities aren't matching up with their vision of what they were. Um, and uh, we need to fix that before, before we pull the plug on work. What is your advice on trying to find the activity that you think will interest you and maybe transitioning to other things if it doesn't turn out to be what you think? Right. That's, that's really uh, spend a lot of time with clients on that, Wendy, is that like you got to go get involved, right? So one of the things we help people is this little workshop that we've done and I'll, I'll make, make it really quick, but there, there's three questions that we ask our clients. And the first one sound, I won't get into today. It's really about how do you change a light bulb that gets into your own personal ability to stay active and your ability to do things. Put that aside. Second question is who do you go to lunch with? So we start asking that question because we want people to start kind of mapping out their relational interests. So do I think I'm going to lunch with people that I work with all the time? I don't have anybody else to go to lunch with. Then when am I going to do tasks and activities? I either have to get new friends, which is daunting for someone, depending on their age, or I have to figure out what activities those people do that I'm consistently involved with. And are those the activities I like? Because it's way easier to maintain relationships when we have an activity to do together with someone, right? So back to you, if you have a group of friends that like pickleball and you guys have a schedule where you're playing pickleball on Tuesdays at this set time, it's way easier to maintain that relationship and to be excited about that and look forward to that activity. So what we help people do is to start to think about that and map that out. If they think it's their kids or their grandkids, sometimes that actually can be a problem because those people aren't where you are. And so that's where our, our clients and one of the things we'll be talking about here is helping people understand the where they need to be because where still sets about a third of your expenses in retirement. So if we don't know where you're going to be, it's hard for us to build quote unquote good spending plans and knowing how much income and money you're really going to need on a monthly basis, right? So how do we start to fix these things? So we got to understand the who we want to be with. What are the activities we like to do with those people? Because then we can start to figure out, okay, what would that really look like financially for me? Is that within my power to do? Um, the final piece is one of my favorite questions that I always ask people. And that's a question that's kind of sounds silly, but it's how do you get an ice cream cone? And what that gets into is the ability to understand that where I'm living, what's near me, right? And my personal mobility. So as I age, one of the challenges is going to become is when do I lose my own personal mobility and are the people that are around me where I need to be to support me. So as we find out our activities, our interests, it's really also so people related, right? Is that we are, we are people, people, we need people. And if we don't know who those people are and we don't identify them before retirement, we can get very lonely and isolated. Those are the people, quite frankly, that all of the data back to I'm a nerd um, suggest don't have a very enjoyable and fulfilling retirement timeline. So that's what we want to help people figure out before they pull the trigger on that, right, is that we need to plan another little 
expression that I learned very early on my career is that we plan our work, work our plan. And so if we don't know what our plan is and we're not practicing it, that's the working the plan, then we're usually not going to get the outcomes that we wanted or expected. And then we're like upset at this point in time in our life where we should be thrilled, right? We should be doing the things that we love doing, but we're not because why? We didn't plan well. And so now we're not executing it. And we're, there's this like disconnect. And that's one of the things we really try to help people figure out is how do we close that disconnect? Well, Brett, this has just been delightful. I have just <laughs> really enjoyed chatting with you today. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're probably not going to cover as many questions per day as we thought, but uh, the answer I, is I knew that that would not be a problem. We would not, you know, run out of questions because you, you'd like to chat. I'm a chatty person, which is yeah. kind of funny because actually I test out as an introvert, which most people would not expect, is that when uh, when left to my own devices, I can go days without other people. And I'm pretty happy with that. But then yeah, when but I meet somebody. You still probably talk to yourself. <laughs> I do talk to myself a lot. Uh, you know, growing up as an only child, that was pretty much the only friend I had. Oh. And so uh, it was uh, it was a lot of that. Um, and that's quite frankly why I was so close to my family is we moved a lot. And that that movement. Uh, made that my mom and I early on really close. Um, I was a big mama's boy. Um, uh, when I got to high school football, everybody picked on me quite a bit because I wouldn't cut my hair. <laughs> everybody else had shaved their head and I wouldn't do it. And they're like, and they're like, why? I said, my mama won't let me cut my hair. <laughs> and they were like, well, and I was like, no, mama said it was almost like, you know, Forrest Gump or uh, yeah. water, water boy level funny uh, in terms of that. Cause I had such a good relationship with my mother. And then through my teenage years and, and as a young adult, my relationship with my dad really grew and got stronger even beyond um, what it was when I was a child. And um, th th that grounding in that family has been a huge part of, of what I do. Well, I look forward to uh, delving into more information uh, as we go along, learning more about you and helping those that are looking to make the most of their retirement. So, uh, Brett, how do people get in touch with you? Well, the easiest way is to initially uh, just go to our website. Um, it's a mouthful and a lot of letters, but if you just look at, at our word, it's artisanwealthstrategies.com. That's the best way to find me. There's a little inquiry there. All of our phone numbers are there um, and email and all that wonderful stuff. And then once again, I'm just Brett at artisanwealthstrategies.com. That's the best way to reach us. And then um, you know, someone from our team will connect with you and, and start the process. Like I said, we believe in relationships. So the first part is just to get to know you. There's nothing about those initial steps that are going to be anything more than you spending some time with us and us spending some time with you to see if we're a good fit for each other. So we'd love to meet you, uh, get to know your story and figure out how to help you accomplish what you want. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today. Please like, follow, and share Handcrafting Your Retirement with your friends. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. Thank you for listening to Handcrafting Your Retirement. Visit our website at www.artisanwealthstrategies.com or give us a call at 317-660-2855. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Artisan Wealth Strategies. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member FINRA, SIPC.